Hi everyone, I'm Tim. Um, I am a uh, computer scientist, aerospace engineer, who gradually became a manager and got more boring. And then decided to start a startup uh, called Asporia. And um, <clears throat> I'm one of the three guys. Um, there's Issa, who's right at the back over there. And I'm sure he's not with us at the moment. Um, but I'll just give you a little overview of what we're up to, what we're doing, and hopefully you find it interesting. So I'm actually going to skip straight out of the slides and I'm going to go over here. <coughs> I'm going to say how, um, how this all started. So in 2011, uh, I got engaged. I actually found somebody stupid enough to marry me. Fantastic enough to marry me. Um, and this was over in, in Florence, and um, I've done exactly what Ed recommended I did do, which is use a live internet connection um, for live demo. So this is the actual application running, and um, I ended up, uh, if you guys know, has anybody been to Florence before? Okay, a few. Uh, if you know Piazza Michelangelo, that's a fantastic view, so got engaged just down, down here. And then after that, um, the two of us went to Sri Lanka. So I'm uh, doing nationality British in Sri Lanka. And I thought, okay, I should go show my new fiance uh, what Sri Lanka is all about. And so we headed off there. And um, here's a, a map of where we where we went. And just so you know, this is using uh, what used to be Google Attitude, Twitter, Foursquare, uh, Instagram, Facebook, something else. Uh, Tripit, yeah, that's the thing. So, um, <clears throat> and we were actually uh, right here. Anybody been to Sri Lanka? One person, okay. <laughs> so if you know the, the west coast of Sri Lanka, um, you probably know that uh, if you just drive down the side, there's a lot of beaches, uh, most of them are empty and quite fantastic. And at the time, I really wanted to find a turtle hatchery that I'd been to before and I'd recorded somewhere on my um, online history, but I couldn't find it that I was looking. Fantastic 3G coverage in Sri Lanka, by the way. And despite that, I couldn't find it on my Facebook, I couldn't find it on my Foursquare, I couldn't find it anywhere. I recorded it somewhere, but I couldn't find it. And this was really bugging me. So <clears throat> spent, um, I spent a good hour not asking directions from anybody, uh, so I was too proud for that, and eventually gave up. But then um, Emily ended up asking somebody, and we found it the next day. And uh, there it is. That guy's not eating it, he's uh, <laughs> showing us a, a turtle, and that's actually Emily holding the baby turtle for the first time. Um, and this is where it all sort of started. Um, really wanted a way of just aggregating all my social media, having all of these uh, things in one place, easily searchable, and um, actually being able to relive a lot of the stuff I did a long time ago, especially with the location context. And uh, what you've been seeing is a few features of the product so far. And this is another feature called My Places. And this is uh, a map uh, <clears throat> showing every single point clustered onto a Google map uh, from lots, all my different services. This is, uh, this is backed by Elasticsearch if you're interested. And we're also using a custom geofacet uh, against that to, to generate this. And so this is this is going to go really badly, but let's try Go on internet. Come on Google. Okay, there you go. So you can, you can start to zoom in and these clusters are generated in near real time. <clears throat> so, um, let's say you can keep going down. Eventually you'll get to the individual points. <laughs> there you go. So you can start clicking on them and see exactly what each one was at any particular time. 
and of all the number of times you've been there and any photographs taken and any statuses or whatever it is. Another feature we have is uh, what we call achievements. And uh, this automatically figures out the countries you've been to, gives you badges because badges are fun, and uh, makes uh, what we, we're calling a travel graph which is a map of all the travels, either according to all of your data, or uh, as you scroll down, year by year, so you can start to see what you've done every year. And so that's, that's a very quick overview of the product, and uh, I'm really happy to show people afterwards what else it does. So the talk was really uh, about some of the challenges we've had, and um, but one other thing we are doing is we are we currently have an iOS app which sort of replaces uh, Latitude, although it goes a step further and it uses much less battery life. It um, <clears throat> automatically detects places you go to. So, for example, right now, hopefully, it should have detected that I went to the BCS. And it would have named it. And it would have put it into my timeline. And it will uh, do this without any interaction from the user. So you press start and you go on all day. Great. You come back and you end up with tracks and then uh, specific places that you've been to. So, <clears throat> how did we end up getting here? Uh, so, the first problem we had to solve is we're talking to all these different services, and so you need to authenticate with all these different services, right? And that should be quite easy because there's this fantastic standard called OAuth. Yeah, it's all the major stuff. I love the people about them. Um, and that should be really, really great. And so we thought, yeah, naively, let's just make an OAuth consumer. And, great. and um, I don't know if anybody's seen the Service Case CD. Great. Okay, so we very quickly learned that. Uh, although OAuth is a standard, there are everybody implements it a little bit differently, just enough to make it painful um, when you're connecting to multiple services. So that took a long time, and then we ended up with a generalized um, uh, consumer which handled lots of different uh, use cases and edge cases. And so now we can build a connector with about this much code. So that's actually our Facebook uh, authentication code. So it's nice and simple. And the next problem is, okay, now we're connected to all of these. Um, I hope, uh, yeah, I, I picked the one piece of code which is not cat uh, for any Python people, <laughs> but the rest of it is. Um, the other problem, the next problem is, okay, we can connect to all these services, how do we get the data, how do we store the data? And so this is, of course, um, a big data problem, or so we, uh, so we thought. And everybody has a completely definite, different definition of what big data is. And um, I was, so just to put it in context, I was talking to my dad the other day, and he was talking about this great big data problem with his computer science. Um, this fantastic big data problem that he was solving, and so on. And uh, I said, so how, how much data have you got? And it turned out he had about three megabytes worth. And I was like, mm, OK. He did start off on punch cards, so his definitions are a little bit different. And everybody's definitions are a bit different. So I thought I'd just tell you what ours are, just to put it in context. So on average, our users have about 30,000 records in our system. And at, on average, 27 points a day are being added in about 2.4 networks. <coughs> and um, so this posed a few challenges. And one of the biggest challenges is actually trying to get that data in quickly and displaying something to the user by the time they finish their registration process. Actually having something that's visible and hopefully useful for them to look at. Just, um, which is a very different problem, as we discovered, to just storing the data and being able to access it at some point. So, um, our big data story, um, a story of woe and horror. 
uh, because it, we had quite a few bumps. And we started off with Postgres in the de facto uh, database, and we've got Postgres, create geospatial extensions, etc. Et Brilliant. Okay, we're going to use the best time there. Um, and this was quite some time ago, so things have changed and moved on a long lot since two years ago. But the, the problem was we had issues with schemas, we had issues with joins, and uh, some issues with scale. And this started to become a problem much sooner than we expected. It actually started to become a bit of a problem with uh, 50 users. And um, so we had views that were starting to take 30 seconds to load, and because we were still figuring out what we were doing with the product, we were changing data structures very regularly, we were adjusting things, and data migration started to get very painful. So we thought, okay, let's start to look for another database. And we did a bit of cursory research and we found Neo4j. Neo4j is a highly scalable, robust, fully asset native graph database. That's fantastic. We have highly connected data, um, lots of connections to all sorts of different aspects in the system. This represents our data brilliantly. And we kind of you know, saw that it was highly scalable and didn't really think about it after that. Now, the situation has improved. Um, sorry, I'm just going to say, so we, so we implemented Neo4j. We learned uh, Tinkerpop, uh, Gephi, we, we, so we used loads of tools to sort of, uh, figure out what, how to use this. And we got to the point at which we needed to be able to scale, and we thought, how do you scale? And it turned out, at least at the time, that the only way to scale was to add RAM. <laughs> Mm, okay, um, and it was it was really bad reaction. Um, just wondering what on earth uh, do we do now? Because um, we, we can't just keep adding around. That's not going to scale horizontally. So we started to look at what else was out there, and we looked at React, we looked at Cassandra, we looked at CouchDB, we looked at MongoDB, and this time we did a bit more of a structured test. And we started to, we ran the same tests against all of them, we benchmarked all of them, and then we looked at the support that was out there and what we could do practically, uh, bearing in mind we're mostly a Python uh, code base. <clears throat> and uh, in the end, we actually went with CouchDB. Um, Don't this slide for a second. We went with CouchDB, and that was because of this great incremental MapReduce feature which allowed us to write to disk really quickly, but then we would have the indexes almost in time. We thought there was, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with CloudAmp, they host CouchDB and they do scaling, and there was an open source scaling tool called BigCouch. And we thought, yeah, okay, we'll use that. Turns out BigCouch in, uh, outside of CloudAmp doesn't work quite as well as inside of CloudAmp. And so we started getting stuck with that again. And eventually we talked to the nice guys at Couchbase at uh, Mountain View, and they helped us out uh, quite a lot and um, helped us to move over to Couchbase, which allowed horizontal scaling trivially. You just keep adding servers and it magically takes care of stuff. So um, we ended up with a system that looks a bit like this, and that is. Data comes in, we use uh, Celery and Amazon SQS. <coughs> that gets put straight into Redis to make sure that there is some data for the user to see when they sign up. Uh, that's also used for cache, and then that gets written to Couchbase. We push that data onto Elasticsearch for that My Places view that you saw. And we also have our own custom reverse geocoder uh, written in the for j um, to handle uh, the shear load and uh, to avoid cost. So, for example, if we were using Google, that would cost us something like $100 per user per year, and that wouldn't really work so well. So, we ended up writing our own. And yeah, so some metrics right now, it's, it's, been, it's been a little while. And something that's quite exciting is that our iOS app, 90% uh, of our users are actually just using it every day. 
uh, they're not sunny enough, and it's actually quite cool to see that. We've got about 1,300 users, 2,000 trips recorded, and uh, users in 74 countries. So that's all quite, that's all quite fun. Uh, as I mentioned, there's myself, Issa, and Sean, and we all do a bit of everything, but there's basically two techies and marketing growth in business. And I thought I'd leave you guys with this. I don't, you guys have probably seen this visualization before. Anybody seen this visualization before? It's a Chrome experiment. But this is using our data, so this is coming straight out of a database. And this is showing uh, the height is logarithmic, uh, uh, proportional to logarithmic quantity, if that makes sense, of how many times a person has visited that particular space, uh, place. And so you can see, start to see that people have been to Hawaii, Christmas Islands, uh, even Antarctica. Um, we've had users go to the far north of Siberia, lots of people have gone to North Camp. Um, basically all over the world, and it's actually really kind of satisfying to look at this from time to time when you're building it to see where, where people are going. So, um, yeah, I used up my time. Great. <laughs>